The question of political economy is, of course, a question about human nature, the nature of the state, the nature of the polis, of society. It's these great philosophical questions. Um, but I would argue that the, the genius of the intellectual tradition that really took off starting with Adam Smith in 1776 is just the basic idea that political economy or this question of, okay, under what conditions do people flourish is in part an empirical question. Uh, most of you probably know Adam Smith was a, a Scottish moral philosopher. There was no discipline called economics in 1776 when he wrote his book, The Wealth of Nations, and he had written a previous book actually on moral reflection called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And then he turned to this question about political economy, and it was an inquiry into the wealth of nations. In other words, the question, why is it that some countries or some empires seem to prosper, more and more people seem to sort of emerge from poverty, and others don't? That's in part an empirical question, but of course, as we all know, there, nothing is n never merely an empirical question. Uh, we, we aren't just sort of these disembodied souls floating uh, with sense data coming in unfiltered. All scientific knowledge is ultimately the result, when it's genuine scientific knowledge, when it's true scientia, it is the result of this interaction between theories and observations, between hy hypotheses and empirical data. And we develop hypotheses that try to account for the data, uh, and if it's a good theory or hypothesis, then it will account for that. And ideally, you develop a body of knowledge when you do that. Now, what's funny is that I, I've been debating the sort of question in virtues of markets for about uh, more than a decade now, and I'm, I'll, I'll just say I'm Catholic, and among fellow Catholics, very often, people that have not studied economics, they may be moral philosophers or moral theologians, don't actually think there's economic knowledge. They don't actually think there's anything uh, empirical or theoretical that you just simply ought to learn in the same way that if you take a seventh grade chemistry exam, uh, you're gonna learn the periodic table of the elements. Now, unfortunately in economics, there is no periodic table of the elements, and so that's what makes it difficult. But here's the kind of key question. Are there economic truths? Are there just truths about the matter that we discover as a result of interacting uh, as partially kind of a historical observation, partly a, a theoretical exercise in which we try to account for underlying patterns in political systems and economic systems that are generally true, that, that hold? I'm not going to say economic laws, we're not talking about physics here, but just truths or principles. And if so, what are those? Because notice that, that's actually a more fundamental question than how, how do we fuse traditional uh, Burkean conservatism uh, with say libertarianism or something like that, right? Which is basically how do we fuse two uh, in some ways very different political ideologies or philosophies together. I'm, I'm always reminded of a guy I met about eight years ago when I first moved to Washington, D.C. So D.C. is a, a non-representative sample of, of the universe. And so you meet very eccentric people um, at, at various things. And so this guy came up to me because I'm a Christian that talks about markets. And he said, well, I had a parent who was a Randian, that is a disciple of Ayn Rand, and then another who was an evangelical Christian. And so my life's work is to fuse the thinking of Jesus with the thinking of Ayn Rand. <laughs> okay, now that's a fusionism for the ages, right? I mean, it's an incredible kind of, and I, and I didn't really have the heart to say that's, that's not gonna work. I, you should probably try to do something else. It was his life's work, I didn't wanna say that. And nevertheless, I think the problem is, is that we, the assumption is that you have, okay, we have sort of different political philosophies and maybe we have certain loyalties to each one, we like certain things in each one, and so we wanna try to fuse them. My suggestion is that when we're, we're forging a new conservative synthesis, that instead of trying that, let's start by saying, okay, what is it that we actually know economically? First of all, is there anything? Or is it just competing uh, moral visions of the universe or political philosophies in which ju it's just a sort of debate about our, our pre-existing assumptions and the, there's not any actual kind of empirical data that can be brought to bear. Now, most people don't go that far if you press them on it. Nevertheless, I do think there's a strain, there's certainly a strain for a long time on the left, uh, that either there aren't uh, economic truths or that they don't really matter for political success. So that uh, demagoguery, if it can appeal to a majority of the constituents in your district, works just fine, even if the policies you actually advocate end up harming your constituents. But I would assume that, among, that conservatives believe generally in the true, the good, and the beautiful. So that strategy is not going to be available to us. That is, we're not going to appeal to a, a demagoguery around an idea that's politically saleable, but false, 
or harmful, that the role of leadership is to do something different than that. So um, my argument is that essentially there are some fundamental truths that we can learn from history, that we can learn from economics, and any responsible political economy, any responsible conservatism should take account of that, right? Now, I don't have enough time to detail what I think those were. I, did, I spent a few years trying to figure this out. I've got a, an academic article I've handed out, and I've got copies for those of you that aren't here. And my, and my question was essentially this. What do economists know? That is, what are those things that are the object of knowledge rather than mere speculation or, or mere or say moral philosophy uh, masquerading is that? Um, and this is what I think is so important about that tradition starting, we can start with Adam Smith, because he's the first one that, that at least in a systematic way said, let's try to tease out the normative question, that is what ought we to do, from the empirical question, that is the what, what would happen if we raise the minimum wage to $100 an hour or something like that. And then the why question, which is the theoretical question, what do we understand about the relationship between supply and demand, the function of prices and so forth that might explain what always happens when we try that policy. Um, and then what I think is a kind of key insight of economics is just the simple systematic use of prudence. And so prudence is essentially the virtue of seeing the world as it is, that is trying your best to see reality as it is, and then adjusting yourself accordingly. So thinkers like Henry Hazlitt and, and the great uh, American economist Thomas Sowell have, have made, made careers on essentially this. As Hazlitt says in his uh, great little book, Economics in One Lesson, he said, uh, the art of economics consists in looking not merely at the immediate but at the longer effects of any act or policy. It consists in tracing the consequences of that policy, not merely for one group, but for all groups. In other words, just that intellectual habit of saying, okay, that's, that policy sounds nice, it kind of gives me a charge, it you know, sort of gets my hormones going, um, that sounds nice, but if you master the art of economics, you'll say, is that actually going to help people, right? And that, that right there, that very act, is distinguishing the normative question from the descriptive question. And so I would assume, because the reality is in most economic questions, you don't actually know the answer to the normative question if you don't have any sense of the descriptive, right? I mean, if you say, well, what, why don't we raise the minimum wage to $200 an hour? I know no one proposes this, but imagine someone said this, and then we'll all be rich. Uh, the, the, the art of economics would just simply say, okay, that's nice, and then what would happen? Um, and if you know some basic economics, you understand what prices do, that as Richard said, prices uh, ideally in a competitive environment with the rule of law, will signal the underlying economic realities. So you want a price system that communicates accurately underlying realities. That's, a, that's a, a, an economic realization or discovery. And then use that to shape uh, our policy choices. Not what charges us, not even what might work in the short run politically, but what is actually good, about, uh, good for human flourishing and accurate uh, for human beings. And so let me give you just a couple of examples. Where am I, Marion? We've got about uh, four minutes. Oh, great. Okay. I'll talk more slowly then. <laughs> let me give you just a couple of examples of places where I think these are sort of potential fractures between people that maybe, maybe not in this room, but I would say somebody that's a sort of deeply committed libertarian rather than a conservative. Uh, to two questions. I think big tech is actually... It's difficult, but I actually think there's a regulatory way that solves it without a lot of the fancy stuff. So let's talk about uh, immigration in China. So there were a lot of us, and I include myself in this in the 90s, that were worried about China, but hoped, we had a hope. We hoped that if China, the People's Republic of China was included in the sort of neighborhood of nations and we traded freely with them, that a rising middle class would lead to greater political and religious freedom. That's what I, I was hoping for at the time, right? Now, we don't have literal free trade. What we have is managed trade with these entities like the World Trade Organization in which you make these agreements uh, with other countries. And, you know, so it's, it's, it's never kind of any purest free trade, but that's essentially what we had. It was based for many people. Now, I assume there were people in corporate boardrooms thinking, great, great, there's a lot of Chinese people that can buy my stuff. But that was the philosophical justification for this 
was that China, unlike the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany in the, in the 1930s and 1940s, is not our enemy in the same way, and they're moving in the right direction. So let's trade with them and hope you get a few hundred million middle class people and they push for political and, and religious freedom. That didn't happen. It just didn't happen. What we've got is a new kind of political order. I don't know what to call it. It's not strict state socialism in which you have state ownership of factories and farms, right? It's not like the Soviet Union in the 20s. Uh, it's a weird kind of socialist cronious mercantilism uh, that combines that with an imperial spirit. So that I think the reality is, and I'm just speaking for myself, is that China, the, the People's Republic of China, not the people of China, is uh, the, the key adversary. Uh, of, of the free world. And so what do we do with that? Because we're now entangled with China in a way that we were not with Nazi Germany, that we were not with the Soviet Union. The, the, the kind of reduction to the absurd uh, of that would be that the National Institutes of Health managed through a nonprofit to fund gain of function research in the Wuhan Institute of Virology, and that is almost certainly the source of the the coronavirus that causes COVID-19. That's just the reduction to the absurd of this approach. Let's, let's give them the, this task. Absolutely crazy. Now, the assumption is, among the, mo most of us in this room and at this conference, is that disentangling from China will help the working class. It will help blue collar workers. Maybe. But what if it doesn't? What if actually the disruptions from it actually make it harder for lower, middle and lower income people. I don't know that that's the case, but that's the kind of question that uh, the, the art of economics is going to encourage us to ask. What are, the, what are the full economic implications? Now, I for myself think that we simply cannot treat China as a, a, um, a fair trading partner in the way we would treat the UK or France or, or Australia or something like that. The question is, uh, what are we going to do about it? And what are the genuine implications? And then immigration, very quickly. There's some, uh, uh, some libertarians, for instance, that just focus on the economic question and say, well, on economic grounds, we know that because of division of labor and opportunity costs and comparative advantage, given the free flow of labor, labor will tend to go to where it's most valued. Right, that, that makes sense. It's a kind of Smithian analysis of things. And so given the free flow of labor, if somebody's labor is worth more uh, in the United States than it is, say, in Syria or, or in Mexico or wherever, then they'll tend to go there and they'll be more productive and better off there than they were somewhere else. And I'll, let's just grant that that argument is largely correct. The problem is, is that it's entirely an abstraction. Labor doesn't move around this entity called labor. People move around. Families move around, and they have religious assumptions, they have cultural baggage, they have world views, right? And so, that, so what we're dealing with is actual people. So that the economic analysis, it doesn't capture the full kind of political and cultural reality of immigration. And so the political economy question is going to be, how do we balance those things? It's not going to be this highly simplistic open border stuff. Right? It doesn't have to be absolutely no immigration. It's going to be some prudential place in the middle. I don't think these are all, all that especially hard, as long as you keep the separate questions separate and recognize that any sort of action is going to have an economic cost. Let me finish. This is the only time I will ever do this in finishing uh, a talk quoting Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. But I think this is a, sort of the one, the one good thing he said. He said, we must think things, not words, or at least we must constantly translate our words into the facts for which they stand if we are to keep to the real and the true. And so what we want to do in forging a new conservative consensus for the 21st century is to find out what's true about economic reality and incorporate that into our political philosophy. Thank you very much.